welcome everybody today again with already our fifth webinar uh, of the whole series. Uh, my name is Leon Stille. Uh, this webinar is by the Energy Delta Institute and the New Energy Coalition. Today we're going to talk about the, new, the North Sea region, the North Sea energy region, the, the effect on, uh, on Corona and on the energy transition in general and what the role is of the North Sea. I'm joined today with uh, my colleague Miralda Schott from the New Energy Coalition. Uh, she's a project manager and with René Peters, uh, who is director of gas technology from TNO. Uh, they're both very well uh, versed in the North Sea energy projects, have been working on it for a, a long time. So I hope you, can, you guys can enlighten us a little bit on the status of the North Sea energy region and how this all is evolving with respect to Corona. René, can I give you the floor? To start. Yeah, okay. First of all, uh, thanks for the invitation, uh, Leon. No problem. No. And uh, I think the theme is very important because the North Sea is really where it's currently happening. The whole energy transition is happening at live at the North Sea mm -hmm. because while uh, the oil and gas production is diminishing, uh, offshore wind is coming up and being uh, developed, as we all know. But there's a lot more happening uh, on the North Sea, so I hope we can tackle this yeah. uh, in oh, the yeah. next hour. I'm sure you can. Right? Uh, <laughs> and maybe it's good to look at this uh, sheet first, because, we're, of course, we're moving from a grey energy system towards a green energy system. Uh, and that's not only on the electrons, uh, where we're moving to renewable energy from wind and solar, but mm -hmm. we also need uh, green molecules. Yeah. And hydrogen is one of that uh, the green molecules that we will need in the future. Mm -hmm. And as we know, it can be produced uh, from green electricity, but it can also be produced from uh, natural gas or even from coal. Uh, and if we capture the CO2, we still have decarbonized uh, energy yeah. uh, and we call blue, it blue. Blue hydrogen. That's yeah. the blue hydrogen. Exactly. So, yeah. And it's important to realize that in all these colors and all these different energy sources, uh, whether it's molecules or electrons, the North Sea plays uh, an extremely important role. Because it's not just for producing the electrons, the green power for, from wind, which we will use to produce either green electricity or green, hyd uh, green hydrogen. Uh, but also for the blue hydrogen, we have CO2, which we need to capture and store. And at least in the Netherlands, we can only store the CO2 in the offshore depleted gas fields. So mm -hmm. we need offshore infrastructure to store the, the CO2 and enable the blue hydrogen to be developed in the near shore uh, areas. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to that. That's uh, an intermediate. Later. Eh? So the blue is intermediate and afterward yes, goes to the green. It, this, this, definitely. Uh, it's yeah. an intermediate and, yeah. and we will need the CO2 storage <coughs> for this intermediate period until we have so much electricity from, from green power that uh, we can transfer uh, transfer it into into hydrogen. Mm -hmm. But even on the grey part, we're still producing uh, natural gas uh, at the North Sea and even oil uh, in, in other areas. Uh, we can reduce the emissions of, of methane and CO2 from this production process mm -hmm. by uh, using green power to, for example, drive the compressors or drive the facilities on the platform and thereby reducing the emissions on yep. CO2. So in all aspects, all colors of energy production, the North Sea area is extremely important for, uh, for the future energy system okay good nice hey, um, um, just one question in between is that for, you mentioned the gas fields as well like is that still this force is still going on but do you know how long this this production is still viable for yeah the North sea? well clearly we're in decline mm -hmm. uh, there's the most of the fields in the north sea are the small fields uh, we also always compare it with the groningen field as the big field yeah uh, but there's plenty of small fields uh, in the North Sea which are all in decline. Uh, that's not completely true. There are still new fields to mm -hmm. be developed. Uh, so actually, uh, also in the North Sea on the gas phase, we're in a transition. We are uh, we have depleted gas fields, which are clear, close to uh, decommissioning and closing. Mm -hmm. But we also have some new developments uh, and new fields uh, which can come on stream if the investment climate yeah. allows actually this. We'll get to that later probably yes, as well. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so we are also in the North Sea in a sort of a transition phase on the gas uh, production side. But there's still enough to be produced, enough to be discovered and to be developed. Mm -hmm. And even with the current uh, production, we can move uh, on for the next uh, decade at least, maybe even more mm -hmm. but if you add all the exploration potential which is still there in the north sea uh, the production could go on uh, well into the the 40s yep. uh, but that all depends on the investment climate uh, and the willingness of the industry of course to explore and develop yeah, new and assets. political climate as well right how fast yes. this whole transition is going yes yes and we'll we'll get to that probably okay. as well <laughs> Good. yeah um, but uh, at the same time, we're already uh, now removing uh, assets at the North Sea. And I, I made an overview here, which is from the World Energy Council analysis uh, on what is the uh, status of decommissioning uh, in the North Sea and not just in the Netherlands, but also in the countries around us, uh, UK, Norway. Uh, there's, of course, a little bit in, in Denmark and, and Germany as well. 
And as you can see, there's a huge investment needed to, to decommission all these assets, uh, which are partly platforms, partly subsea installations, mostly in the UK and Norway, mm -hmm. but also pipelines, which uh, may have to be removed. That's not uh, certain for yeah. every pipeline. And the cost estimates are huge. Mm -hmm. Only in the Netherlands already 7 billion euro estimated by next step and 5 million on top of that if we would remove all the pipelines. That's actually both onshore and offshore. Uh, and what is important to realize is a big share of that is a societal cost which, because a lot of costs can be deducted from, from tax. Mm -hmm. And that means that there's also an, an incentive actually yeah. for the government to stimulate uh, um, reuse or clever repurposing of these yeah. uh, assets. Instead of completely removing this uh, this, uh, this infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. If, if, if this because infrastructure this still has value, yeah. uh, for example, for CO2 storage, for uh, hydrogen transport, mm -hmm. uh, for storing uh, CO2 in the depleted gas fields, uh, then these assets can be reused uh, with uh, no. added value for the new energy system. Yeah, because we had a question about it, to be clear, is that most of these, these costs you didn't mention, this money is available in principle, at least to, to decommission this, uh, these assets. But yes, this has been reserved yeah. uh, on the balance of most of the oil companies who own these uh, assets. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, they are prepared to decommission and remove all the assets. The question is whether that is the best uh, option in all cases, yeah. uh, because if we want to store CO2 in the future <clears throat> and the assets uh, are removed or the fields are closed down and yeah. the wells are cemented, then these assets are not available anymore for, for the future uh, functions like CO2 storage or even energy storage in the form of hydrogen if we need it uh, in the long term. Yeah. Oh, we'll have to maybe re be rebuild it again, which is, of course, not the best scenario. No, yeah. that's not the best yeah. scenario. And if you look in timing uh, on the decommissioning, uh, this is a graph we took from uh, the Next Step report in 2018. Next Step is the organization <coughs> in the Netherlands looking at reuse and decommissioning of assets. It's a collaboration of all the offshore operators, but also EBN. And as you can see, uh, there's a sort of a minimum and optimum uh, uh, planning for decommissioning of assets. But uh, the, the, the orange line is the expected uh, potential for reuse, which mm -hmm. is well below uh, the other lines. And it means there's a big gap between yeah. the timing of the re, uh, 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 for the decommissioning of the infrastructure and the potential for reuse. Now, we have to be realistic. Uh, we're not going to reuse all the assets which are there. Mm -hmm. We're only reusing these assets which are critical in the future uh, sustainable energy system. Mm -hmm. That could be pipelines, that could be a few uh, depleted gas fields for CO2 storage. But if, for example, we would need uh, large-scale energy storage in depleted gas fields, for example, with hydrogen, we also need to find out which fields are perfectly suited to store energy for a long period of time in the future energy system. Yeah. Do you, can you give me some idea, like how many, what's the percentage of, of you think you can reuse in the optimum scenario? Yeah, that's what we are studying in this North Sea Energy ah, okay. program that yeah. we are working mm -hmm. on. Uh, there are about 150 platforms still in operation uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, and actually already this year, three of them have been removed from, mm -hmm. from Neptune recently, L10. Um, but we expect that maybe only five to 10 will be reused and I'm talking about platforms yeah. now, for new functions like hydrogen production, uh, more maybe critical uh, compression uh, function for transport of, uh, of hydrogen or, or CO2, mm -hmm. or for injecting uh, the CO2 into the uh, reservoirs. So for those uh, uh, fields, we will need the platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, pipelines is another uh, discussion. You have big trunk lines for transport. Uh, which are needed to transport energy over long distances. Yeah. But you also have a whole distribution network connecting all these pipelines. So part of it can be reused. Part of it probably uh, has no new function and, and will have to be Yeah, have to be decommissioned anyway. Yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, maybe it's good to look at wind. Uh, yeah, because yeah, I think at one, at one side we see a decline in uh, well, an energy carrier maybe on the North Sea. <clears throat> But on the other hand, we also see a huge potential for uh, renewable energy production, especially uh, offshore wind. Uh, and the North Sea is well known for the shallow waters and the depth is not so deep. So, um, well, it's very suitable for offshore wind lo as a location. Uh, if we look at the Netherlands, yeah, we have currently plans for 11.5 gigawatts um, and, well, plans towards 60 gigawatt or even 75 are mentioned uh, for the the well, far outlook i would mm -hmm. say yeah. if you look at the well the north sea region you can <coughs> uh, number you can think of numbers like 180 gigawatts um but uh, as you see the netherlands has a quite well or very good position in this 
one thing to realize is that um, one of the investment parts is, of course, the turbines, the technology. But another investment lies also in the uh, integration of this wind energy into the uh, backland and mm -hmm. the energy system. Yeah, the connection. Basically. Yeah, the interconnection yeah. And, and all the um, transmission systems that are needed offshore, but also onshore. Yeah, we, in the Netherlands, we see that we need major enforcements of the onshore grid as well. Um, estimations are currently there of 8 to 11 billion uh, euros. And it's good to... Uh, acknowledge that this is also a cost for society. Eh? We yeah. see that the transmission system operator is uh, nationalized in the Netherlands. So part of these costs will also come back towards the bill of uh, yeah. the taxpayer. Yeah, the exactly. Yeah. But then again, you can also argue, okay, if we reuse part of the infrastructure that's already available, if we then change this electrification part also in part hydrogen, part other... Uh, for the storage that we can maybe reduce these costs to a certain extent depending on where yeah, we are and, uh, and especially if you look over um over distance and eh, the, the further you go away from shore the higher the investment cost may yeah. be in the cables uh, yeah, in the cables yeah, indeed, specifically yes yeah. um for offshore winds mm. the investment might also increase a little bit mostly because of the operation and maintenance service located further away uh, and therefore costs might increase quite quite some but I think uh, with regard to technology, there will be still uh, some cost reductions uh, present yeah. and the cost of the technology will go down. Mm -hmm. um, but the integration in the energy system and reuse and system integration will help to keep the societal cost uh, down significantly. Yeah, as low as possible. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and 2030 is uh, quite a critical uh, <coughs> date, I would say, because then we have about 12 uh, gigawatt of yeah. wind uh, power installed uh, offshore. But that's also the moment that the transport grid operator, Tenet, states that the absorption capacity of the onshore grid is more or less yeah, uh, saturated. Yeah. saturated. Yeah. And that means that mm. any additional intermittent production of offshore wind will be difficult to handle in the current grid. So either the grid has to be expanded or we have to find another way to introduce all this energy into the system. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where system integration comes up. Yeah, yeah and we especially may yeah, flexibility options uh, that can also come from electrification slightly. Yeah. Uh, CCS might play a role offshore in that, but also hydrogen or batteries or uh, demand response functions within the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there is a huge value chain of flexibility options that I might not let uh, be researched enough. Um, <clears throat> but that will be a challenge uh, yeah. for the offshore wind, I would say. Maybe a little bit on the shorter term, um, hey, you see uh, hey, there was currently an, uh, a market report from AFRI. They indicated that um, at the subsidy-free subsidy tenders until 2030 are also under pressure. Uh, they see that the electrification of the current market, mostly the industry, is not going fast enough, that demand is still lagging behind. Mm -hmm. uh, and this might, well, might pressure jeopardize down your, the, uh, yeah. Yeah, the business case yeah. for offshore wind. As we have seen a little bit, had to break in a little for the, the current events, is that certainly there's a, a negative price even for electricity at the moment because yeah. demand has fallen away. So your base load is taking over. Yeah, and, and it's even with the corona of, uh, crisis, yeah, with the corona, you see this happening. It, yeah. I think it's a little bit, hey, you see it more significant probably than yeah. expected. And on the short term, hey, you, uh, Vattenfall has won the um, Hollandse Kust 1 and 2 tenders. So they would could have a skill, uh, economics of, of scale advantage uh, also for the Hollandse Kust 3 mm -hmm. and 4. Uh, but they just see at this time, of, <coughs> uh, at this time, they just see the risk being too high uh, to join the tender. And I think, yeah, I think that's at the current stage of very well, short-term risk maybe yeah. to towards the competition in the offshore wind field. Yeah, but also risk to further, I mean, now it's maybe short-term risk, but in the end, uh, somebody needs to make money out of it. Also yeah. the people that set up yeah, these it's, farms. It's not only short-term, I no, would say. No, no, it needs to be a business case that is attractive in the future as well yeah. uh, for us to be enable this energy transition on based on wind. Yeah. yeah. And it's getting more and more complex if we move further away from shore. Yeah, until 2030, the wind parks will be, uh, let's say, within 100 kilometers range from, from shore. Yeah. But beyond 2030, we'll move further offshore, which will increase the cost of installation, increase the cost of maintenance and inspection, yeah. uh, and also the cost, indeed, societal cost of transporting all yeah. the energy to shore. So there's really uh, a, a big challenge to get all the future uh, wind parks yeah. uh, uh, exactly. installed. Yeah. You, need, you need to uh, figure contract. that out together, yeah. Yeah, Maybe it's, it's so good to say it is still an important key also in the, into the transition towards greener molecules yeah. and uh, 
um, yeah, it's a missing part that we still need. So also if we don't solve this issue or don't get the business case around for offshore wind, it's also the, the whole value chain will harm from yeah, this. will be not collapsed, but we'll yeah. be harmed. Yeah, maybe to skip ahead a little bit because I know it's coming up. But it's <laughs> like this: this, how do you, um, how do you see this with all the countries surrounding the North Sea? So, is there a master plan? Are we? We have to all these aspects that you both mentioned, like system integration, working together, connecting the grid lines. Uh, where do you do storage? Where do you do uh, generation? How do? How does the industry evolve with that? Is of course not nation, national, ne Netherlands no. only. Uh, we could help each other in that sense as well. Yeah. Maybe, well, maybe to start yeah. with that, um, you know, I mm. think uh, there is no master plan yet. What you see is that on min ministerial level, um, at, they started in, I think it was 2017, um, with the North Sea Energy Corporation, where on ministerial level they talked about um, and how can we make interconnections, can we make sure that we co can connect the uh, wind farms together. Mm -hmm. And this process is continued uh, for now. But um, on a national level, I'm, well, I'm, I think we, I can say that we are quite far with the system integration perspective yep. and that we are seeking more and more collaboration with other countries, um, but that we are ahead with this. I'm not yeah, sure. yeah. yeah, I think that if you look at the gas, uh, oil and gas business, um, they don't, bother a lot about uh, borders, except of course for regulation, yeah, and, yeah. And permitting <laughs> and th things like Taxes, that. Yeah. But, but uh, there, there's interconnections, there's, there's uh, I mean, a company like uh, like Shell is working uh, cross borders yeah, over, of over the whole uh, North Sea. If you look at the, the, the renewable energy, the wind side, that's always uh, connected to the country where the, the, the money comes from. So mm -hmm. uh, also all the energy produced from offshore wind is being uh, transported back to yeah. the country where the, the, the public money uh, yeah, is, makes is invested. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense now. <clears throat> yeah. But if uh, the, the future wind parks will be subsidy free, uh, and it's maybe geographically more interesting to bring the energy to another location, maybe even to another country, yeah. uh, why not cross a border and look more yeah. on the North Sea perspective on the integration of the energy system in the North Sea? Yeah. And that's, of course, one of the uh, uh, visions of, of the North Sea Wind Power Hub also, to have at the Doris Bank one, one uh, island, or maybe in the future uh, multiple ones, which connect countries uh, to distribute the power yeah. produced with offshore wind to the North Sea countries. And of course, the next step is not only to look at the electrons and the wind power, but also to look at hydrogen uh, yeah, as a way to parts, the, the other parts yeah, of yeah, the yeah, energy system. system. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 80% of yeah. the energy system at the moment is molecules and not electrons. Yeah. So in the future, <clears> we envisage that actually the whole uh, North Sea as an energy system should be, should be looked at as an integrated system whether we have Brexit or not, whether we have uh, Norway as a member of the European <laughs> <laughs> Union, we have to look at this as a, as an, as a North Sea basin or one North Sea uh, basin as an energy source for Northwest Europe. That's, yeah. I think, very important. Exactly, yeah, because we share it all, of course. And, if you, yeah, and the energy the transition also does not know any borders, actually. Yeah, and, uh, and there is to, uh, emissions. And yeah. there is a lot of value of thinking cross borders and thinking on systems and not just on sectors or on, uh, on regions yeah. only. Mm -hmm. I can give an example. If there's platforms who could benefit from getting renewable power to electrify their platforms, but they're mm -hmm. at the border, uh, and at the other side of the border, there's a big wind park. And yeah. the wind park has excess electricity, but it has to transport the electricity back to shore of the country where it's positioned at, while just five <laughs> or ten kilometers cross border, there's a platform who could use this uh, electric renewable power to decarbonize their processes. Yeah. And that could be a big benefit, but it's not allowed at this moment. Yeah, it's more difficult. Yeah. 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 So we have to look at it as an, as, a, as an integrated system in the North Sea. Clear. Good. Yeah, because you, this, this shows also, uh, like you said, it's, it's a big puzzle. Uh, it's a big... Uh, yeah. There's so many moving parts in the North Sea. It's quite full already. Most people don't realize that. Yeah, yeah. and we are now currently <coughs> discussing the energy part. Eh? But it's also, as René said, it's part also from a bigger system. It's not only about energy anymore. It's also about fishery, uh, getting enough food, uh, getting enough uh, sand extraction to make sure that we are still safe if the uh, yep. water level rises in any how. So it's, uh, it's just important to notice that it's not only about the energy system, it's mm -hmm. also the integration with other users. And uh, can we use um, offshore structures as rigs or mm -hmm. rig to reefs as breeding places for uh, ecology, um, 
and also the the interaction with nature parks just across the border yeah, it's oh. also we can make nice plants in the netherlands but if we are just harming nature well somewhere else somewhere yeah. else yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's also something that has to be uh, taken into account of and in the netherlands we have now the onderhandelingsakkoord where where the first steps are made to discuss how the various uh, uses not only the energy uses um well could make multiple uses make uh, multi-use in North Sea possible and I think that's a first very good step uh, into this process yeah the coordination yeah. step yeah. yeah yeah so in the past mm -hmm. uh, the, the North Sea was was considered as a, as a puzzle where you just put a function on every location yeah so this is a shipping lane and this is a, a marine uh, a test environment and this is a platform for oil and gas production and that's a location for wind mm -hmm. and then we have some nature uh, reserved areas uh, uh, as well but i think the future challenge is can we actually combine these functions so we make efficient use of marine space why can't you produce uh, uh, um, seaweed in a wind park uh, why yeah. can you can't you combine uh, oil and gas production in a wind park if you can find an alternative for helicopter uh, flights? Uh, and I think that we have to think much more into uh, combinations and yeah. multiple uses of benefits. the marine space. Yeah, additional, additional benefits, benefits yeah. additional value, and combination of, of space. Well, of course, there's now the, the, the agreement, mm -hmm. the, the North Sea agreement, yeah. between all the different functions, uh, the combination mm -hmm. of energy, uh, ecology, and food, because fishery is still important for yeah. our food, for, for, for fish, of course, um, but also the economic functions of, indeed, uh, sand production and, and shipping and things like that. And then on top of it, the energy, which is a challenge on its own, because the energy is in a transition from oil and gas to, yeah. to wind. And that big puzzle we have to solve. Uh, so we are only looking into the energy challenge, yeah. but the challenge on the North Sea is much bigger than that. Yeah. But looking from the energy perspective, would you say also that, Miralda, uh, like, what is this most important part? Is this not even the space that affords us in the North Sea, the, 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 the ability to, to reuse infrastructure? Is this not one of the most significant parts of the Netherlands where we can yeah, do this energy transition, where we go, go, go green? Yes, and I think it's also a major part where we can do it without uh, putting the most effort in. Yeah. Um, so the most so, cost benefit. Mm -hmm. is. Yeah, yeah, so uh, if you look for at the, at, <coughs> at the very short term, we have currently the, oil, the existing oil and gas production. And as René said, we can already save a lot of emissions if we electrify uh, the compression process. Yeah, so if we look at the short term for the next next five to ten years, we can um, well we can clean and uh, we can uh, prevent emissions from NOx and CO2 by just electrifying the compression process. Mm -hmm. um, and this is uh, this is now currently there are some legal changes making this possible as well. Uh, it was first of all it was not possible to make an offshore connection like mm -hmm. Rene said, um, but there are some changes in law that this. Uh, that allows that. That allows yeah. that, indeed. Yeah. And then electrification is also a first step to make other system integration uh, options possible. Mm -hmm. So if you don't then look at the mid, yeah, medium term, uh, you can think about um, CCS, this carbon capture and storage, where you use the uh, still the electricity to uh, make sure that you uh, can pump the CO2 in the uh, empty gas fields. And even at the later stage, you can use this infrastructure, the pipeline and the platform, or probably potentially also an island by then, uh, to transport the hydrogen that you produced offshore. Yeah. So I think um, at the timeline <coughs> of integration options, is the roadmap for these integration options is very important to make sure that we make the right decisions, because um, we have a, a very narrow window of opportunity. Yeah. And we can only use or reuse if it's still there, uh, and therefore I think it's wise to make smart decisions about mm -hmm. de decisions about that. Yeah, and just to be clear, the CCS in this part, uh, you mean not only from uh, the platforms itself and from decarbonizing, for example, the gas to make blue hydrogen, but also from other industries in the Netherlands that are yeah, where CO two can come from, so we can exactly yes also yeah. store that w uh, in the in those fields. Yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe just to. On that. Uh, maybe one, one yeah, because CCS, of course, yeah. initially was more from the power industry, but we, we are beyond, beyond that to a certain extent because yeah. there are different options for green power, for CO2 uh, uh, neutral power. So now we're talking about, okay, 
can we decarbonize industries and other processes more yeah. where we store the CO2 in the fields? Yeah, and, and in the Netherlands, we're lucky to have a lot of industries very close to the to shore. Mm-hmm. Actually, four of the five industry clusters in the Netherlands are <clears> located uh, near shore, of which, of course, uh, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, uh, Eemshaven, Delft Zeel, uh, but also in Zeeland, uh, a lot of CO2 is being produced from industrial processes, mm-hmm. which can partly be uh, uh, changed into either electrified processes or using new hydrogen, green hydrogen. But for the meanwhile, uh, also blue hydrogen as an intermediate solution can be applied to actually decarbonize these industries. So on the long term, uh, reusing infrastructure uh, onshore is being proposed by Gazini. This uh, is the, dedic- the dedicated backbone for hydrogen as mm-hmm. considered by, by Gazini. But on the right, you also see the offshore infrastructure, uh, which is uh, there and will become available in the next decades to come. Uh, of which the red lines are the main trunk lines, let's say, uh, coming from the far North Sea to uh, to uh, mostly Den Helder uh, and uh, uh, in the in the north at Eemshaven, Uithuizen actually to be uh, explicit, and in Rotterdam. <laughs> Um, and those infrastructures could be used either to transport the CO2 from these industrial clusters to the depleted gas fields, or they can be used on the longer term to transport the hydrogen, which is produced from offshore wind far offshore, beyond 100 kilometers offshore, uh, towards shore. And if you look into the CCS, which is actually the next uh, uh, sheet, uh, you can see uh, the key fields which are identified as potential uh, storage options for CO2. Mm-hmm. Uh, and some of them are still near shore, like uh, near Rotterdam, the P15 and P18 fields of Taka are well equipped to store CO2 from the Rotterdam uh, area. And of course, the Portos project is the first project which is planning to, to do so. Uh, but if you look further offshore, uh, especially in the KL uh, blocks, yeah. there's a lot of uh, gas fields with huge potentials to store CO2. In total, there's about 1,700 megaton of CO2 storage capacity in the North Sea, all, all in depleted gas fields. Which is a lot if you realize that the current cap uh, of subsidized CO2 storage is only seven, uh, 7.2 uh, megaton per year. Yeah. So we can Very little. Uh, yeah. we, we can spend a lot of uh, time storing CO2 in our depleted gas we, we checked all these fields. Uh, were, were they geology checked or is this just an estimate? No, no. The, the, this, for uh, these fields, it is checked <coughs> whether uh, these fields are, are capable to store CO2 and have the right uh, conditions on the injectivity and, and uh, wells and, oh, yeah. uh, and, and the conditions are, are fine to to store it. Uh, it's, it's maybe good to mention that it's not just CO2 storage, like traditionally we're talking about CO2, capturing for it from a power plant and then continuing yep. uh, the, the dirty way of working, let's say. <laughs> uh, and and they're just sort of CO2, but it's much more now related to actually hydrogen production. And then in particular, blue hydrogen production. So it's a traditional hydrogen production from steam methane reforming or outer thermal reforming in the future, but then in combination with CO2 capture uh, um, and storage, uh, and in that way enabling and initiating a hydrogen infrastructure in these industrial clusters. So it's not just Portos, Atos, Aramis as, as capture projects from an exi- existing industry, but mm-hmm. also future capacity for blue hydrogen, yeah. not only in, in Rotterdam, the H Vision project is, is a big one, of course, but also uh, last week announced that Den Helder has also plans to go into a blue hydrogen uh, option, which is very attractive, I think, because there's a lot of pipelines ending up in Den Helder, mm-hmm. which connect to these offshore fields in the KL uh, blocks uh, yeah, where definitely. CO2 can be stored. Yeah. Maybe there's a question also from the audience is that you have this blue and green uh, difference, yeah, basically. So yeah. first blue, maybe, and then green. That's yeah. basically what we're proposing, uh, what people are proposing, also with this project. Yeah. But is it also, can it be a bit of a risk that you choose, that you don't go, for example, directly to green and then uh, skip this step? Yeah. Is, it, is it cheaper or is there a rationale behind it to do first blue and then green? Or yeah, I, I think the, uh, there's there's position for both. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's also needed to have both because at the moment, green, ele- green hydrogen should be produced from green electricity, but we don't have sufficient green uh, electricity to actually yeah, uh, use this uh, yeah. for, for green hydrogen production <clears throat> because we need all the green electricity to get rid in the end of our coal-fired uh, power plants. Yeah. So it will take a while, at least uh, well uh, beyond uh, 2025, maybe even 2030, before we have sufficient uh, green electricity from offshore wind and, and, and probably also solar mm-hmm. uh, to, trans- to, uh, to produce green hydrogen. Until that time, 
uh, blue hydrogen can be uh, uh, realized quite quickly. Yeah. And, and also volumes can be yeah? significant. Yeah, it yeah. can be easily scaled up. It, it is speed. Yeah, the process it's also is scale yeah. because you, the, the blue hydrogen can uh, mm-hmm. is scaled up quickly. You mm-hmm. don't start small, you start big. Yeah. That's a big difference. Uh, and of course, there's also still the market and the economic aspect that blue hydrogen is relatively cheap compared to green hydrogen at the moment. Yeah. That may change, of course, over time. Uh, but the, those are all arguments why blue hydrogen ha- has its position. It will be an intermediate solution probably, but if it's 10 years or 20 years, nobody uh, yeah, can tell. Yeah, still pretty good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's it, it's a quick way to start <clears throat> reducing the CO2 emissions from the current hydrogen production that we already have. Yeah, to, to generate the demand and supply as well that is required for hydrogen economy yeah. in general. Huh? And maybe to add to that, uh, if you if we look just at the North Sea, um, and we if we if we all are believers of a hydrogen economy, the North Sea might not be big enough to produce our whole... Uh, demand for hydrogen. Mm-hmm. So uh, probably there will be um, some wave, ways of blue and green next to each other, or blue might be substituted by input from from other countries like the uh, Sahara and the and like the well the sub-Saharan yeah, yeah. countries. <clears throat> um, so I think it's also it's a luxury to say that we can all produce it on the North Sea. So yeah. um, we also need the electricity from the North Sea, and if we need electricity. We should not convert it towards mm. hydrogen already. Maybe not everything. Huh? Yeah, we, yeah. Can, we, will, we will not convert all electricity to hydrogen. Um, there will still be a high uh, electricity demand and there will still be, if there is a hydrogen economy, a- additional demand and that can be blue or that can be import. Um, but it's a luxury to say that we cannot have them both. Yeah, uh, no, it's There's really, an urgence really, uh, to have them as quick as possible. Yeah, of course, we looked yeah. into uh, into yeah. this in the North Sea Energy uh, program. So mm-hmm. what is the amount of, of, of wind power we need to actually uh, produce green hydrogen, for example, for the current use in the yeah. Netherlands, which is about 0.8 megatons. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there already you need about eight, eight gigawatts That's only of for the current wind power use. for the, the current use. use. New use yeah. now for refineries and things like that. If you were to chemical. replace that with green hydrogen, ah. you would need eight gigawatt. Yeah. But we are currently at one gigawatt in yeah. the North Sea. And uh, up to 2030, we will be at 11.5 gigawatt. And all that power will still be needed to green the electricity uh, in our energy system. Yeah. Uh, and even the North uh, H2 project, the new project, which was announced by, mm-hmm. by Gazony, uh, Groningen Seaports and Shell, they have an ambition to move to to 10 gigawatt in the end, eh? um, which is then about the current use of hydrogen in the Netherlands. So there's a huge additional demand yeah. of wind power, which we need for producing this green uh, uh, hydrogen on yeah. top of the green electrons that we will need in our system. Yeah. And that means that probably also in the future, we will have input import of green hydrogen in our harbors in, in, in Rotterdam, for example, of green hydrogen produced elsewhere, uh, maybe even from, from low-cost uh, solar. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Because Southern maybe there's not enough space even to do it all in the North Sea. It could be, but it's... Yeah, yeah. I, I think you should also realize we also have other users. Yeah. Um, and you have to take account of uh, nature areas, ecological function, fishery. Yeah. Um, so there should be a good balance and it might might also be good to not do everything yourself in that sense. But mm-hmm. I think looking at the North Sea, there's a huge potential to do part of it ourselves. But it also depends on how the demand in their hinterland uh, develops. Yeah, yeah. Very clear. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe speaking about eh, the offshore conversion, um, what we currently do within the North Sea program, we look at the potential of offshore hydrogen uh, production. That we look at different forms uh, production on energy islands, production on platforms. Uh, we even looked at uh, production within windmills at, uh, at the earlier stage. Um, and it seems then that given that the distance increases and the volumes of wind increases, that it might become interesting interesting to do this offshore. Uh, we mm-hmm. also now see more industry parties uh, uh, taking action on this. And this is an image of Tractabel. Uh, where they um, well de- developed the concept of a 400 megawatt hydrogen platform offshore. Um, well, we're currently trying to receive some data, but uh, we're not sure whether this is an existing platform or whether this is a completely new platform. New, new plan, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that can also be uh, the case. Uh, but you you see the importance of um, t- uh, system thinking, yeah? not only thinking in one functionality anymore, thinking about uh, electrons and molecules uh, jointly at the same time in the same system. 
Uh, and other initiatives are also coming up. Uh, I saw two days ago that Ørsted and ITM are, thi are thinking about the concept of uh, putting an electrolyzer in a windmill. Mm -hmm. Well, the same do we al also have, for instance, in the Netherlands eh, with, the with the hydro company thinking about this concept. We see energy islands. Uh, But wouldn't you then have the problem that you do this, this, this things twice? So you have this wind wind farm, then you have the electrolyzers next to each other, and then you still have to have some uh, cable connectivity to a certain extent. Or are you then deleting mm. the cable connectivity to land and put the only hydrogen there? That will probably, uh, if you have the uh, electrolyzer in the windmill constant, it will probably just be uh, one connectivity in that's molecules. Yeah. So you don't have the choice anymore. You still can do partial uh, windmills for electricity and partial, of course, for hydrogen. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the advantage is is that um, the output of a windmill is DC, and the input of the electrolyzer is also DC. So you also okay. saving on some uh, conversion step, uh, steps, yeah. and therefore the efficiency of the whole conversion chain mm -hmm. uh, will be higher. Other advantages, like uh, with the, for instance within the layout of a wind park. Uh, how that may benefit, um, and that still have to be researched. But I think there is quite some potential in doing it as close as by towards the yeah. source of electricity to make sure, well, you can. Uh, yeah. This is by team ten times it. cheaper, eh, in compared yeah. in, uh, in volume yeah. of energy to to transport But molecules compared this, to. Uh, this is a complex uh, optimization. Yeah. Uh, because we we're looking into integrated uh, islands eh, where both yeah. electricity and hydrogen mm -hmm. could be produced. And the question is, uh, uh, what is the future way of delivering all that energy to shore? Is it only hydrogen? Is it only electricity? Or is it a combination of two? Yeah. And I think our, our current view is that it will be a combination. So the, the, the wind operator is able to, to provide his energy to the power market or to the uh, hydrogen market, mm -hmm. let's say, the gas yeah. market. Uh, and those are different markets with different dynamics, different uh, incentives and drivers. So there could be some uh, optimization also economically to mm -hmm. get all the uh, energy and the, the, the value of the energy produced offshore to the market. Uh, but for that, you need both uh, infrastructures yeah. to, to transport but, the energy. But isn't that then a bit double? If you f you take the high overview that this energy transition we need to make as cheap as possible for everybody, so that uh, in total we can do this quickly and mm -hmm. with the less pain that we, we need, that if you have this fixed next to each other, then I'm I'm, I'm now a bit guessing, like, okay, no, why no, would no, you no, do no. that? Uh, <laughs> and indeed, it's an optimization, but uh, currently the power cables are only used by about 50%. Okay. Because the load factor of the current offshore installations is about 50%. It, mm -hmm. it goes up if you move further away and if the turbines get bigger. Yeah. Uh, but if you have a combination of hydrogen mm -hmm. and electricity, you can use the full capacity of your uh, infrastructure. You can uh, The capacity of the pipelines is, is so huge. You should think yeah. of about 10 to 20 gigawatt uh, and transport they're there capacity. Already. And they're already yeah. there. Yeah. So you can really start to optimize to, to make more most efficient use of your infrastructure and still uh, uh, balance and optimize on your uh, market value. Okay. Is there any, because there's a question about it, is there any legal restraint? What's the biggest legal restraint in, in trying to, to set all this up, you know, with the, the fields, with the, the changing the platforms, with integrating these systems together? Do you know that, one of you, maybe? Like, what is the most legal uh, pressing uh, uh, well, barrier that is just being specific set up? for transport of hydrogen? Huh? There are some um, well, legal uh, barriers with regard to admixture, and mm -hmm. yeah, so we have a certain percentage that you admix. Another legal, I'm not sure whether it's a barrier, but what you currently see is that most of the installations fall now under a different legal regime, and we have a statute yep. under the mine, and we have the Water Act. Okay. So the yep. overview of having all the, um, well, because mm -hmm. eh, we don't speak about one one process anymore, we, mm -hmm. we speak about different uh, items within the value chain, uh, it's And we have to see whether in what kind of legal yeah. framework they fall and, al and yes. be aligned in that That's again the yeah, system thinking that you were talking about. It, yeah. It's extremely yeah. important because there's, there's a huge amount mm -hmm. of, of regulations and laws which apply for uh, for working offshore and in the North Sea. Actually, we've done a legal study on the North Sea Energy yeah. Programme. I think the report is public on our website. Okay. Uh, maybe um, after the 15th of June. After the 15th oh. of June, <laughs> you're correct. <laughs> uh, maybe we'll publish all the results. Mm. But f for example, if you want to transfer uh, a platform oil and gas platform to a hydrogen producing platform, it moves from a mining uh, mm -hmm. asset towards uh, a water work. 
Okay. And those fall under different uh, legal uh, yeah. uh, regimes. Uh, and so, so, so the Mining yeah. Act states that you, if you stop producing oil and gas, mm-hmm. you have to remove it and decommission it. Uh, but uh, uh, if you want to transfer it to a hydrogen production facility, then it doesn't fall under the mining law. So, so okay. that, there's, uh, there's so some, not some, a legal coordination. Guide, there's a lot of challenges yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. The coordination still yes. needs to continue. Yes. But I think that is that is part of, I mean, hydrogen in general, that we have to look at it in a different way. Also on land, like what are the, the, the regimes that yeah. it falls under? But it is extremely important mm-hmm. because changing these regimes and these laws and these regulations take a lot of time. We yeah. all know this can take many years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you need this change to make the transition happening, and we're now talking about pilots on hydrogen, we'll get yeah. to one in a minute, uh, yeah. you have to think about these changes now. Yeah. And you have to start the processes to optimize yeah. this fiscal regime or the, more, more the, the yeah, policy the, the regime policies, or the legal yes. regime yeah. Same uh, with to CCS, make it happen, huh? to yes. make it possible. Same, Same with CCS. CCS. Same with CCS. Same with CCS. Yeah. And there it, it is in place, actually, yeah. those pilots uh, uh, which have uh, already uh, per- permits. But uh, to give an example, this is uh, the Poseidon pilot, which we are currently planning in the North Sea as a pilot for mm-hmm. demonstration of hydrogen production. Actually, it's not a, an, in a depleted field or a, a platform which would have been removed. This is a platform platform which is not that long there and still producing both oil and gas. So it will be a combination of production of oil and gas and hydrogen. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the only electrified platform on the North Sea uh, from Neptune. It's Q13 uh, just offshore The Hague. And it feeds its electricity uh, from shore, uh, green electricity from wind and solar power. Mm-hmm. And we will actually put a hydrogen production unit on this platform. Uh, we will take seawater, uh, desalinize it uh, on the platform with reverse osmosis, and then uh, with electrolysis uh, um, uh, p- convert it into uh, hydrogen, green hydrogen. And actually the green hydrogen will be injected into the gas stream, actually the oil and gas stream, and transported to another location where the gas and the oil will be separated And then hydrogen will be transported to shore, Mm -hmm. where it will uh, get ashore in the Gazuni transport network at uh, Maasvlakte in the Rotterdam area. Uh, And also there's a limitation because uh, the gas system in the Netherlands cannot allow more than 0.02% at the moment, which is, of course, too limited to to allow uh, more admixing uh, in the future, which we will need. Uh, But this pilot is currently being planned and being uh, developed uh, uh, just to learn about what it takes to bring hydrogen production offshore. Yeah. Because, of, of course, the, the next decade we will do the hydrogen production onshore, near shore, inland. Mm-hmm. But if the wind parks move further offshore, above, let's say, 100 kilometers, yeah. then hydrogen uh, be offshore advantages. becomes an, an yeah. advantage. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah and mm-hmm. I think it's very important to get on this short time already knowledge. Yeah? So maybe you have to adapt certain systems. Um, is it technological pro- possible uh, so that you can also work to solutions uh, in the short term? So I think that's... That's mm-hmm. the main importance to already have such a pilot, yeah. um, well, relatively short term, I would say. Yeah, to, yeah. to be able, again, eh, what we said several times already, to be able to have this demand also, that the, or the supply of hydrogen, that there's more and more hydrogen available, that it can be easily uh, scaled up, but do mm-hmm. hydrogen first, so you can make sure that the hinterlands, uh, as you called it, is also uh, ready for it, eh? uh, so that the, the people can use this uh, to a certain extent. The industry first, probably, and then afterwards, perhaps other processes. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, that is extremely important because if we look at the North Sea, it is an energy production region yeah. for whole northwest Europe, for the Netherlands, for the UK, for Norway. Uh, but in the end, there has to be an industry which is able and willing, uh, and also economically uh, willing to pay the costs no, of the green hydrogen yeah. or the blue hydrogen. Or even for electricity. And even the yeah. electricity and a reasonable price, uh, and also to deliver the CO2 uh, to be stored uh, offshore. So there, yeah. that's why system thinking is extremely important. And it's not just the power sector, it's also the chemical industry yeah. and the refining uh, sector and the, the steel production uh, yeah. sector. Yeah, because there are more, of course, uh, and there's a question also that is related to uh, would we then would it not be better to to stimulate more electricity production in the North Sea area for direct use, for example, with electric cars, yeah. and to 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 scale up the demand there first yeah. instead of going first uh, going towards the molecules as well. Is that yeah. a, a, the, any reaction uh, on that? Uh, everything you can do electric. Yeah. I is think there's no preferred. choice of uh, doing one first or the other. No. You yeah. should do all. Yeah. 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 Um, but the thing is with uh, cars and uh, that it's quite distributed energy, mm-hmm. so electricity. So if you run into problems within the uh, current electricity network, 
um, hey, it's more scattered. Yeah. So yeah, or, for, or for maybe, industry, you can even think about direct lines with wind park. Which yeah, that's right. Also, maybe heat for industry is also another yeah. example mm -hmm. that at least you can generate more of the electricity demand. So you have to invest in the network. Okay. But that can be a choice. That's, yeah. But, and yeah. I think yeah. the advantage of industry is that they are mostly located at geographical close relations. Uh, uh, areas next mm -hmm. to each other yeah. so you can make probably make direct lines or uh, direct transmissions mm -hmm. and for cars or households it's a little bit more difficult to well uh, get the direct line to uh, Drenthe and yeah, yeah. Assen and Emmen and yeah. it's less yeah. economically interested to uh, well to yeah. look first at the bigger place yeah. Yeah. but there is an important argument uh, also to go to hydrogen maybe earlier than, mm -hmm. than you would like because if you look at efficiency in the value chain it's always better to to to, to stay uh, on the in uh, with electrons and and yeah. have the power directly yeah. used for mobility or industry or whatever but if there's more and more intermittent production coming on stream from solar and wind there there's there's this problem of balancing the energy system and balancing uh, the energy system is much easier with molecules than with electrons mm -hmm. Uh, because the, the batteries and, yep. and uh, power uh, stability is, is much more difficult to maintain than, than with molecules. Uh, and there is a lot of storage capacity in molecules available if you think about salt uh, caverns or depleted uh, gas fields, which yep. could be used for balancing the energy. So uh, the, the hydrogen uh, <coughs> or the green hydrogen produced from, from offshore wind or, or also onshore solar uh, probably is not only to feed the 80% or at, in the future maybe less, of the energy system which is not electrified mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's also to provide uh, balancing to the energy system as a whole yeah, balance and storage yeah. balance and storage yeah. and that those are two reasons why an integrated system where ele electrons and molecules uh, can be uh, converted in, in both directions mm -hmm. are extremely important to create a stable and sustainable yeah. energy system of the future yeah, no, okay. yeah. maybe we talk about a little bit because we're already a bit yeah. at the end about our the, the the current situation so the risks that yeah. are associated with corona but also with other aspects of the, uh, the current national international uh, situation for the north sea uh, how do you see that uh, what are the risks of that? I think you're an a, yeah, can, I can I can tell a little yeah. bit. Um, <laughs> well, I think we're all aware that th this is not just a problem only of Corona, of a virus which which uh, decreases, of course, demand significantly in the energy sector uh, as a whole and in in the industry. Uh, and of course, also creating a health risk and mm -hmm. a safety risk to, to the people working in the industry. But there's a lot of things coming together here because even before Corona, the situation in the oil and gas sector was already not that good, at mm -hmm. least not in the North Sea area, with extremely low uh, gas prices in particular. Yep. Oil going down now as well, but the gas price was already extremely low, below 10 cents per cubic uh, meter. Uh, the tax uh, incentives that are promised by uh, our ministry have not been implemented and are still for confirmation on, on state aid uh, uh, by the European Commission. So that's not uh, implemented yep. while in our surrounding it. countries. Yep. UK, Norway, they are much more attractive, so that 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 actually attracts much mm -hmm. more industry investments to the to uh, UK and Norway rather than the Netherlands. Uh, and then on top of that, the stringent NOx uh, emissions. Uh, the Dutch trade organization NOGEPA uh, looked uh, what the impact would be on the oil and gas projects, and they state that 30 projects of in total investment of 800 million are now waiting uh, or cannot be continued okay. because of the NOx. Uh, Only uh, because of the NOx. Only yeah. because of the NOx. They made a statement about that. Yeah. Uh, and on top of that, the whole mm -hmm. permitting process in the Netherlands on new projects and 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 uh, new initiatives, well, on Onshore developments is, of course, not uh, allowed uh, at all. Mm -hmm. Only continuation of onshore yep. oil and gas operations is allowed. But even offshore, uh, the permitting uh, uh, phase and process uh, takes an extreme uh, long time. There's also a new development, or is that no? That's that's already, already that's already going time. on for a yeah. long time. There's yeah. no direct relationship to to the to the corona outbreak. No, but also not for other reasons. Really. Um, no, no, uh, no. I mean, yeah. that's just. I a think it's system, uh, yeah, the, the system, but also public uh, um, opposition mm -hmm. uh, against new uh, initiatives yeah. and also NGOs opposing against uh, new developments of oil and gas, which actually delays the permission process, yeah. and that makes it less attractive for industry to to invest. And all that coming together means that the the future for uh, at least the oil and gas related activities in the Netherlands are not very uh, yeah. bright, let's say. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there were already delays, but with all this coming together, it, it will delay things further. 
Um, and that means that we're back to the beginning of this presentation, where actually the gap between the decommissioning and the potential for reuse is actually even broadening rather than, than shrinking. Yeah. And that is a, a, a big threat, I think, to the future alternative use of infrastructure for, for example, the CO2 storage or for yeah. hydrogen transport. So um, I think uh, we should very quickly identify the critical assets in our infrastructure from the offshore assets, mm -hmm. which we will need for our future energy system and actually secure them before they will be decommissioned and plugged and abandoned and not be uh, available for future use. And that's no. extremely mm -hmm. important uh, in this so moment. Thinking ahead a little bit, yeah. doing a better coordination job. It's, it's interesting yes. that you mentioned that because it's similar to what's now politicians from the EU also calling, eh, if you look at it, the wider picture of the Green Deal, like, okay, we have yeah. the corona now, which is a big disaster, okay? Mm -hmm. It's a bit of a reset. So once we are starting up again, no. can we not point where are we going to invest all this this rescue money in? Yeah. And that can be similar for the North Sea, I think. Yeah, and, and, and not only for the oil and gas part, eh? you no, also no, see no, now for currently for yeah. offshore wind, um, yeah, you see potentially a delay in the installation of uh, offshore wind turbines. Just because that certain parts of the value chain are located in the uh, yeah, in the global world, so China is a major producer. Um, that also risks the development, and of course, you already have to operate in a very narrow weather time time uh, mm -hmm. block. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, th this might also lay to a well delay the operation time and potentially risk the subsidies uh, that offshore wind park operators uh, gain. So also in, on the short term, there is the risk of corona eh? delaying part of the installation process, I would say. Um, and, at, and on the other hand, I had the uptake of the market and uh, what, we are, what we currently see is uh, the fact that offshore wind as a business should, be, should remain interesting uh, yeah. for operators to invest in. Yeah. And that is, I think, together with uh, reuse, there might be challenges and uh, chances for uh, lowering the costs, uh, lowering the cost not only for the wind park operator, but potentially also for the whole society and also um, and may maybe some rapid, uh, more rapid increase in the installation yeah. process. Who, who should or orchestrate this ideally? Because now everybody's talking, looking, of course, at the national government, EU government to, to really, uh, you know, uh, fix this problem of COVID-19 uh, to, to make sure that the economy will, will remain standing. Uh, also for the North Sea, we already talked about it, it's a bit fragmented. Who, is, who, who do you feel is, is, should be in charge of this? Is it industry more first? Is it government first? Is it somebody else? Yeah, well, we're, we're back to the puzzle that <laughs> yeah, we discussed exactly. earlier. Eh? Yeah. This is a complex puzzle <clears throat> where electricity, electrons and molecules interfere, uh, where industry plays its role because they have to take the investments, but also the government is, is of key importance because they will uh, have to provide the infrastructure and, mm -hmm. and, and reserve uh, space. So I think it's a, it's a common uh, joint uh, uh, problem, and that's, that's a concern because yeah. then the question but is who is, who, who is then exactly. in the lead? Who's the lead? Yeah. Uh, I think what is of key importance mm -hmm. is that now we define uh, our vision on how, how the new energy system of the North Sea will look in, let's say, 2030 and beyond, mm -hmm. say between 2030 and 2050, because until 2030, we reasonably yeah. know how things are going to, to develop, yeah. and it takes 10 years anyhow yeah, yeah. to install. install you got some historical yeah. lines that are already yes. in yeah. motion. So, so, so it's now fine. important to have a vision about uh, the, <coughs> the period beyond 2030 and identify the critical areas and critical assets which we need to, to reserve. And I'm thinking of the main pipelines, key reservoirs for storage or key sites uh, where hydrogen production could, could take place. Um, and and identify those as assets which cannot be uh, should not be removed mm -hmm. because of the fields have been depleted or the pipelines are at an at a too high cost uh, yeah. for for maintaining them uh, and keep them available for future use and at the same time of course removing all those assets which are not critical and not considered uh, key for yeah. the future so, so those are mandatory still to remove the, you yeah so really the, the, yeah. this is not a plea to actually delay decommissioning exactly. or to to yeah. leave everything on the north See, no, yeah. identify the critical issues, the yeah. critical assets, and remove those who are not critical and, and should be removed anyhow. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. But still, yeah, there's not a clear answer. I understand you can't give it like who is going to be in the lead yeah. in this. Also because you have four or five countries together that need to figure it out. Have uh, we had the Brexit? One question is about the Brexit, for example. Does that have any impact on 
on this, you think, that uh, on this process of coordination, how the North Sea energy system would look like in the future? Any, any thoughts on that? Well, would it be more I, I difficult? Or I would not? say on the, <clears throat> on the business level, mm -hmm. I think it would not have such a big impact. And so what, what René already said, we have... Uh, international players on the on the both the electric uh, electric system as the gaseous system uh, that I invest in multiple countries. So they just look at uh, the regulations, the the market conditions in certain countries, and they just decide whether or not they will join. Yeah. But more on uh, working together with regard to, for instance, fishery. Uh, mm -hmm. You see that fishery is an important mm -hmm. element between the discussions, yeah. also between the Netherlands and the and Brexit. So. Also, on the non-energy parts, Brexit might have an influence on well how we might gonna maybe implement multi-use. And maybe on that vision, like René mentioned, like <coughs> how yeah. do you make this vision between after 2030, 2050? I can imagine that, that of course, the, the UK is still interested in that, but that may, yeah, may uh, be we, different. We have well. a lot of contact with, uh, with the UK and Norway in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, our colleagues of the Oil and Gas Technology Center, yeah. Aberdeen yeah. and, and Sintef and NTNU uh, in, in, in Norway. Uh, and they all uh, are working on the same uh, issues. Yeah. Uh, how to implement CCS and hydrogen and, and reuse and integration of, of the offshore uh, assets. So that does not change. And Brexit they say, forget that. about uh, yeah. Brexit. This is something which, which uh, is important for the whole North Sea. Uh, and and we all should uh, learn from each other and, and and work together to get this uh, this done. Yeah. And and Brexit should not uh, stand in between. Uh, I think I'm I'm sure it's difficult if you talk to fishers, <laughs> uh, fishermen. Yeah. Uh, but, but on the energy yeah, part, small part uh, yeah. we should <clears throat> we should work together. Yeah. And uh, and and I have the impression that also the UK really likes to to continue collaborating on this uh, theme. Yeah. Okay. Clear. Well, it, we are almost running out of time, so I think yep. it's good to. Uh, to, to sort of, hey, you have some, some nice ideas. Uh, the the, the final slide. Let's uh, do this last takeaway from there here. You can <laughs> the last takeaways. I, I think we have covered, of, of, of course, these <laughs> things. But let, let me just summarize them once again. I think, as, as we said also to this last minute, uh, the North Sea is an area uh, of uh, multiple countries, yeah. the North Sea countries. And I think we should think of it as one North Sea. Uh, collaborate and, and, and show leadership in this vision where we are uh, heading towards mm -hmm. and how we can optimize and maximize uh, the collaboration between cross-border, between uh, different countries. Um, I think looking at energy uh, and the energy hubs that and the energy islands, we mm -hmm. should uh, think more in inclusive. And what I mean by that is not just look into wind power or, or electrons, but look also into the, the molecules, uh, the pipelines, uh, cables, look at it as an integrated yeah. uh, system. Um, and in the past, uh, uh, there was a lot of sector thinking. We looked at how can we decarbonize the power sector? How can we decarbonize mobility or industry? And I think, well, hydrogen is a nice example. Uh, we have to stop this sec sector thinking. This is something where we should uh, introduce integrate. system thinking. Yeah. Integrate yeah. Uh, and, and the, the, the North Sea as a source of green electrons and, and molecules cannot be successful if there's not an industry on the other side to absorb and take all that energy yeah. and, and willing to pay uh, the price for it. And the last thing, I think we're really ready, ready after all these studies to start with demonstration and piloting and scaling up. Mm -hmm. uh, we hear pilots announced every week and <laughs> every week they get bigger. I mean, last week we heard <clears throat> the big 40 gigawatt uh, plan, uh, I think, of the European Commission on, on hydrogen. Yeah. It's great. Uh, to be honest, we are at the moment on the scale of one megawatt megawatt yeah. not gigawatt no. <laughs> uh, so we have to realize there's a lot mm. in between yeah. uh, but it's very important to start work on these pilots and administration just to learn and experience and and, yeah. and, and build trust that we can do this I think it's a great call to arms at the end of this uh, this session also uh, nice to see that uh, what we see, talked about here is indeed international cooperation also national cooperation having the North Sea as one big uh, playing field almost where we can accelerate the energy transition and then indeed work together with thinking systems. I think that's a very good takeaway from this session that we need to do that also not only for the North Sea but for the whole energy transition. Yeah. So thank you again. Thank you very much for, for joining us uh, with this uh, webinar. Next week we'll have another one with uh, Theo Fens uh, on spatial aspects of the energy transition. And uh, only questions that we did not manage to answer here we will answer them later and send it to you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mirella. Thank you, Renee. And uh, thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Bye.